Welcome to the Pacific Research Institute's Next Round Podcast. I'm Rowena Itron, COO, and with me as always is Tim Anaya, Vice President of Marketing and Communications. So Tim, how was your Easter? It was very nice. The, uh, the Easter Bunny came. We had lots of chocolate and good candy. And I uh, went to the Freeport Bakery here in Sacramento, which for those of you who are familiar with Sacramento, that's the bakery to go to. Oh. And I got a beautiful little cake that looked like a little lamb that has, uh, you know, for fur, it had uh, little shavings of coconut. And it was very nice. And I got all the little cookies and baked goods uh, from there uh, for a dinner. And then I spent Easter uh, with my folks and I got a whole Easter ham dinner and all the side dishes. And we just heated everything up in the oven all at the same time. So that's That's my idea of a good stress-free dinner. How was your Easter? That would be my idea too. But Tim, I don't cook. So I went to, uh, I spent it with my moms and uh, went to my brother's family and spent it with them. And it was very nice. And and they're all good cooks. So you'll let them do their thing. (laughs) Easter is kind of one of those holidays too, where, you know, one of the best things is a lot of people go for brunch on Easter. And usually the weather, it's one of the first weekends when the weather is is much better. It's raining all week. Weekend, unfortunately. It, it rained Friday and uh, some of Saturday. Sunday was okay, uh, but it's still, it's cold. It's not where you'd want to go out and sit out and have uh, have a champagne brunch on Sunday morning. But, um, but uh, yes, we used to always go There's a, uh, in old Sacramento, there's an old kind of Dixie boat, the Delta King, which uh, you can rent a hotel room there and they have very nice restaurants in there. So I've gone there several years uh, in the past for, for Easter Sunday. You know, I always feel for, and my brother being a restaurant general manager, I have kind of an inside view on this, the poor sucker who has to dress up in the Easter bunny suit. And I don't know about (laughs) you, but I find the people in the, the Easter bunny suit is a little creepy or can be. Uh, And I can imagine how hot and smelly those costumes must be. My brother actually used to be the one until he was the boss. He used to be the one who would dress up in the suit, certainly as Santa Claus. And I, and I think he has more of a, you know, his, his body frame is more geared toward being Santa Claus, but it, 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 it seems cute. But I feel like that just must be awful if you have to be in that Easter bunny suit all day on Sunday. Well, with spring break, Sacramento has sort of gone deep underground these days. So what's happening with the budget now? Now that we're back, you know, the legislature was on recess uh, this past week. So this now begins the major crunch, kind of the bill crunch in Sacramento. And so for the next three or four weeks will be the heavy time in committees to hear all the big bills. And they all will have to pass their first policy committee in the next four or five weeks or so. And so, you know, we'll certainly, as the month of April goes on, we'll be talking about developments with all of the the bills that we're following. And sadly, most of them, the bills that we're following are terrible bills. But adding to all of that is the budget. And we've talked about before that there is a push to make mid-year budget changes even before the governor's May revise is put forward in uh, several weeks. It'll be around May 10th when he releases that. And so the Senate Democrats had released their plan, which was charitably kind of a nothing burger. It wasn't really much of a budget savings. It was more kicking the can down the road. Wayne Weingarten and I wrote a blog on that plan. And and, and according to our analysis, it was something like 19 percent of that plan was cuts and the rest of it was fund shifts and delays and, and, and deferrals and kicking the can down the road. And that got a little cold water from uh, Democrats in the assembly who made clear they don't want to raise taxes and they, you know, were going to be coming out with their own plan. Interestingly, right before a recess, the governor reached a deal with the Democrats in the assembly and Democrats in the Senate for mid-year budget changes. And that would be, it is estimated in a around the 17 or $18 billion range. And you saw there was uh, images of the governor scurrying to and from uh, the pro tem's office and the speaker's office for meetings and camera crews were, were chasing after him. So they put out a statement saying what it's going to be. But unfortunately, 
Uh, we still don't have any, as of this recording, we still don't have any details of what they've actually agreed upon. So I would imagine this is something that has to be, you know, voted on, you know, this coming week or, you know, next week, certainly by the, by the latest, because as we know, the more, the sooner and more significant the budget changes you make, the better uh, for addressing the deficit, certainly. So we'll see, but how, you know, Newsom operates, you know, he talks a good game, but everything is still kind of behind closed doors and in the dark. So we'll see what, what they actually have agreed upon. But to use the language of Governor Newsom, I'm sure whatever it is does not, quote, meet the moment. Yeah, Tim, and you'll stay on top of it. I will. So before we go on to our podcast guest, a couple of announcements. Please join us for a very special dinner on April 10th in, in Newport Beach with our keynote speaker, economist Steve Moore. Steve's going to receive the Baroness Satcher Award. And this dinner is actually part of a, a series of dinners and luncheons celebrating our, our 45th anniversary. So so please join us if you can. And if you're a fan of Next Round, let us know because Tim's going to buy you a drink. Right, Tim? Uh, yes, I'll buy a drink. I'll uh, sign an autograph. I'll take <laughs> photos, kiss babies, whatever uh, whatever it takes to get you all uh, to become fans of our podcast. And a little further out in May, we have a luncheon with guest author Batya Unger-Sargon, and she's the uh, opinion editor at News week. Uh, she's got a hot new book out. It's called Second Class, How the Elites Betrayed Working Men and Women. So our dinner is at the Palio in San Francisco. And if you're nervous about coming into the city, not to worry, because our creative director, Dana Beagle, is a black belt in karate. So she's going to protect us all. <laughs> Where you can find all of the information and registration at our website at pacificresearch.org. Our guest speaker this week is actually a recording of a, a dinner we had in San Francisco we had last month with uh, National Review editor Andrew Steddeford. He's an expert on economic and financial issues, and, and in his talk, he discusses uh, the nation's progressives, especially California's progressives, have a love for electric cars. So his talk is called Electric Cars, Central Planning's Latest Vehicle and Efforts to Mandate Electric Vehicles and, and the Problems that, that Will Lie Ahead um, if These Advocates Are Successful. If you've been following the recent announcements by the Biden administration on electric vehicles and commercial trucks, um, you know, this is an issue that is a, big in the news, and B, uh, as we like to say here at PRI, we've been there, done that on these sorts of proposals, and it's unfortunate that national leaders are following our mistakes that we're making here in California. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and here's Andrew Stutterford. Great. Thank you very much. And uh, it's uh, great to be here. I haven't been to San Francisco since uh, COVID, in fact, so it's, it's nice to be back. I'm going to mispronounce the name of the place, but um, there's a little island off the, um, uh, the coast here called Tiburon, Tiburon. And I was at a fabulous bar in 1987 uh, and um, high Reagan era, and the waitresses wore Ray-Bans and a sort of toga-ish like I thought, God, this is a great country, and that and and that was the moment why when I decided I have to come to America for good. So I have a very soft spot in my heart for San Francisco, although I know it's uh, having a little bit of a tough time at the moment. But then I live in Manhattan, and anyway, so thank you for having me. It's an honour to be here. Capital matters. Just saying, we defend free markets. We we, we that's really our raison d'etre. I don't own a car. I live in Manhattan. There's, there's no point. I, I I rent a car when I. I need to, and that is mainly driving around New Mexico, and I'll get back to New Mexico in a, in a, in a, in a moment or two uh, for very long drives. I should say that I feel a little nervous about coming to California to say things that might be misinterpreted as being rude about electrical electric vehicles, because you people buy them. I, I, I mean, someone has to, and, and, and you do. In 2023, EVs amounted to 25% um, of uh, the new vehicles bought in, 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 in this state, and that compares with a national share of 7.5%. If there are EV owners here today, and I was speaking last night to the Young Republicans, and there were EV people in the audience, and one was then, one of them an engineer, which made it even more frightening. And uh, I should stress that I'm not here to insult your choice, but I would emphasize the word choice. I'm a great believer in choosing the sort of car you're going to buy, and uh, that is where I got interested in the whole question of EVs. 
Because let's be clear, they can be a great choice. They can be fun to drive. They might in time save you money, but it's probably best if they're not your only car. And in the case of the typical EV owner, they won't be, by the way. The typical EV owner owns uh, two to three cars, and the others will be typically conventional cars. And you'll need your conventional car in case it gets less of a problem here, perhaps, but it gets too cold, be tricky. Or if it gets too hot, it can be tricky. And you better be one of the one third of American households that has a parking garage uh, so you can charge the car overnight. Or if you live in a nice area, you can have a private driveway, you can install things. And it also helps if you are wealthier than the average America because uh, EVs are, as a rule, uh, that is somewhat changing, uh, more expensive than traditional cars. So as this is a somewhat right of center gathering, let's quote Karl Marx. Uh, He wasn't always wrong. He famously observed that history repeats itself. The first time as tragedy, the second time as farce. And so it is with central planning. We know from history and we know from logic. Thank you, Mr. Hayek, Professor von Hayek. Um, We had time to discuss that, but we know that central planning does not work. And yet, when you examine the current increasingly coercive switch to EVs, it looks to me a lot like central plan. Frankly, we're going to be lucky to get away with farce. Uh, Central planning is a pathway to the subpar and sometimes disaster. With electric vehicles, we are headed for the latter. But, say the climate policy makers, the planet is boiling. We have no choice other than to act quickly and forcefully. But if it's being boiled that you'll be worried about, EVs are not going to save the day. In 2019, uh, the US cars, and I don't think figures have changed particularly since then, and light trucks accounted for approximately 2% of global greenhouse gas emissions, uh, the EU for a little less. And put those two together, it's still not a lot. What's more, people often describe EVs, it's good propaganda, as clean cars. Uh, They're not, they are cleaner in certain respects. But to, um, and it's true that they don't give off any tailpipe uh, greenhouse gases. In fact, they often don't have tailpipes. But then there are the emissions used to generate the electricity that powers the EV. So you've got to factor in that. Uh, And if you're factoring in an EV in India or China, uh, it's going to be pretty mucky electricity. And then for true comparison, add in the emissions generated in manufacturing and processing an EV and its component. And of course, you do the same when you're making a comparison for conventional cars, but much more material goes into EVs than into conventional cars. Uh, After taking all this, they're heavy. Uh, A a typical um, uh, EV will be, can be uh, 5,000 pounds or more. Uh, And uh, and I say 5,000 pounds is a good number to mention because that's what it takes to go through a crash barrier on the highway. But the good news for you, after you smash through the crash barrier, is that you'll survive if you're driving an EV. Bad news for anyone you run into is they might not. I mean, these are colossal uh, vehicles and are very heavy vehicles. And the reason is the battery. So after taking all this into account, over, over its lifetime, an EV will, and this is according to the International Energy Agency, they're, they're pretty pro-EV, uh, they're very sort of climate change, and they've lost their way badly. Uh, it's probably optimistic to say that, but they will be responsible for a little less than half the greenhouse gas emissions than a mid-sized conventional car. It's, you know, it's cleaner, but it's, it's still you know, not great. And if you look at the writings of someone like Mark Mills at the Manhattan Institute, has looked at this very carefully. Uh, there is good reasons for thinking that the difference is even less than is even less than that. It would thus make no material difference to the climate had those governments that have set 2035, uh, that's the UK, the EU, and parts of the, the US, include, including here, as the date to ban the sale of new conventional cars, had they picked 2055 instead. I don't think, by the way, you should ever ban them, but let's let's give them the point. This would have bought buying an extra, tw- this would have bought an extra 20 years in which EVs or any other replacement technology could have been forced to prove their worth against the internal combustion engine. And they could only do so by improving. And I think as everyone here must appreciate, competition works. In 1900, two technologies, steam and battery power, led the nascent auto market. And before long, however, as we all know, the internal combustion engine had won out. We took about, roughly speaking, 15 years. Thanks to the genius of Henry Ford, 
Mrs. Henry Ford, by the way, thought he was mad and this was completely wrong. Uh, she liked her EV and uh, there, was a, there was a gender divide. Women liked electric cars because they were cleaner. Men were sort of intrigued by the whirring machinery of the thing. The real uh, thing or factor that, that destroyed the electric vehicles of over a century ago um, was uh, range anxiety. And another factor about uh, or characteristic of central planners is they don't, if they read history, they think they know better than it. So they ignored that lesson. And meanwhile, could I just say, as we look at all these bans and restrictions, the internal combustion engine prevailed and no one banned the horse. No one thought of banning the horse. Uh, so free market, bottom up, free market competition is bottom up and the competition is not something that central planners like. It is disorderly, unpredictable, and it does them out of a job. They prefer a top-down world. Deadlines are pulled out of thin air. Orders are barked from above. Dissent is heresy. Targets bear little connection to economic, technological, political, or even geographical reality. California's EV regulations are a classic example of the arrogance and the lunacy of central planning. But for them to be aped, as they have to have been, in vast, empty New Mexico is utter insanity. Think of Khrushchev, if you must. He, he had a great plan to solve the Soviet food shortages, and that was growing uh, wheat in western uh, Siberia, northern Kazakhstan, the so-called Virgin Lands Program. Not obvious wheat territory, not a big success. Think now of a car, look, think of Andrew Stutterford driving as he was a couple of months ago to Pie Town, New Mexico, uh, to, have, to, to get a slice of pie. It was a modest 70 mile drive from Socorro, New Mexico. Actually, there were no gas stations as far as I could see after I left Socorro, but there was certainly no EV charge. Do you want to be in the desert? No. When you run out, when you run out, no, you do not. And there's also a certain irony in the fact that EV mandates, which are inspired by, allegedly anyway, by the climate, take no account of the weather. EVs range collapses, as I mentioned, when it gets too cold, and it's not too helpful if it gets too hot. With central planning, logic is often followed by frenzy. C no longer follows B. B no longer follows A. Uh, everyone is just given it, get on with it, get on with it, and no one sort of sorts out any sort of order. So what happens? Climate-driven policymakers insist on the urgent electrification of the automobile, and it often feels just about everything else, at the same time as they weaken the resilience of already strained electricity grids. We've already had the supreme irony uh, of electric cars. People, owners of uh, electric cars in, in California and in Texas, at least on one occasion, being asked not to charge their uh, cars uh, because, uh, you know, the, 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 the grid was under too much pressure. There was uh, very, hot, very hot weather, I think. One person said to me, uh, this is a true story. Oh, yes, 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 yes. But you don't have to worry about these things because, um, you know, we've got solar here in California. It's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's you know, bright. The sun shines. And, uh, you know, we can... We, we could charge these uh, uh, EVs at night. And I, and I said, well, there's a flaw there. Um, sun not too visible at night time. And of course, well, we don't need to talk about the whole renewables fiasco. We'll get back to our great guest in just a moment. But first, are you following PRI on Facebook? By following PRI at facebook.com slash Pacific Research Institute, that's all one word, you'll be the first to read free market ideas from PRI's terrific team of scholars on all the hot issues like education freedom, single-payer health care, crime, homelessness, green mandates like the ban on natural gas appliances, and more. Plus, when you follow PRI at facebook.com slash Pacific Research Institute, you'll be the first to know when tickets go on sale for PRI's must-attend luncheons, dinners, and galas across the state. And you'll be first in line to secure your spot to hear great speakers like Michael Schellenberger, Gordon Chang, Steve Hilton, and many more. So go to facebook.com slash Pacific Research Institute and follow PRI today so you'll be the first to know. Central planners like to pick winners, and then they like, and that they like to entrench them. Theoretically, um, all that is now in the process of being banned is, with exceptions here and there, internal combustion engines that run on gas, and we can go into exceptions if, if we want later. But the reality is, is the flow of capital investments will follow the EVs, squeezing out other, perhaps more promising, uh, alternatives. In January 2022, Carlos Tavares, who's the CEO of Stellantis, 
That's the world's fifth largest uh, car maker. Uh, you will find Fiat Chrysler tucked away in there somewhere. Uh, he described electrification as a technology chosen by politicians that was being, quote, imposed on the auto sector. And that doesn't bode well. The guy knows his cars. Here is what he's saying. Another person who knows about cars is my hero, actually, is Akio uh, Toyoda. He is the former CEO and now chairman of, uh, of, of Toyota, obviously, he's a family. I think he's the grandson of the founder. Uh, he has been warning for some time that to force car makers to take one route to electrification is too big a bet. Uh, he, he wants te competing technologies and he wants consumer choice. These are sort of things that free market people like and the sort of thing that Mr. Toyota likes. Mr. Toyota is also, was also the CEO of uh, Toyota that makes the Prius. So, you know, there's a certain amount of self-interest there. But uh, although he might be predisposed to be biased, he doesn't mean he is wrong. He sort of got into trouble. Uh, one or two, Toyota was lagging a bit on the EV front. Uh, in fact, a bit, quite a lot. But also he irritated noisy American shareholders, some of whom might have been based in California, and some of whom might have been managing public money customers. So he was uh, essentially pushed out, but in a very Japanese way. He was demoted to chairman about a year ago. And I think, judging by his merry smile, he is enjoying himself. And uh, the, uh, the stock hit a record high a few days ago. And what was it driven by? Above all, by the sale of hybrids. Current generation of EVs are being allocated a mass market role for which they are simply not ready. Average motorists are being asked to pay more to receive less. And I emphasize the, the average. Again, there's nothing wrong with the guy who wants to, or a woman who wants to, who wants a, a, you know, has a niche interest in all that. And that shortfall in performance is being compounded by the fact that supporting infrastructure, specifically charging stations, is not with the exception of Tesla's ready. Tesla has done good things here. Tesla, um, seeing an opportunity, has also been opening up its uh, network to third party, but Tesla cannot do it at all. Other companies, auto companies, are also trying to get into this market. We'll see how that goes. God help us, uh, the US government has said it's going to help. And we all know what Ronald Reagan had to say about the help. Uh, my colleague, uh, Dominic uh, Pino, had a great stat. I think there's $7 billion or so allocated for the government help to the, uh, to the, charging, uh, to the charging network. As of, in the, the, the law was passed in 2021, as of when Jonathan, George, Dominic wrote, which was in November, how many charging stations had actually been built with government money? Zero. But they're optimistic that some will be coming through in 2024. The charging network is uh, building out a genuine... Uh, genuinely adequate charging network is going to take time and vast amounts of money. How it will be paid for remains, for the most part, a mystery. You, the the, the money is not there in the in the IRA. Uh, you've also got to build out the grids. I mean, the knock-on cost is absolutely extraordinary. No one knows how it's going to be done, if they're honest about it, which they won't be. Another, another key characteristic of central planning is all too often the blithe assumption that problems will be resolved somehow. Technologies will appear magically. Everything will work. It's a fingers crossed approach and it would not pass muster in a market oriented uh, framework, except possibly Silicon Valley, if I can say that here. But in the end, if it was a private company, you pay the consequences. Government doesn't happen, doesn't seem to matter. It all just drags on. Central planner carries on in their jobs. And what happens then if somehow it never turns up? How are we going to find all the metals and the minerals we need to make EVs? Conventional cars are mainly made up of iron and steel. Simple stuff. But the manufacture of EVs is going to need, for example, a lot more copper. Now, the metals needed for EVs are, are there. Uh, look, for example, at all the lithium that keeps turning up since, you know, interested in it started really getting going. But the process of establishing the mine, get hold of them, is not quick. It can take a, a, a decade or more. And um, that's if we're lucky. Uh, and... Um, this is assuming that we want the mines to be based uh, in here or in friendly uh, countries. The, in the, in, under the current timetables, EV mandates assume a supply of the necessary metal that is not yet there. Um, one, there is one possible partial and unpalatable solution, and that's the Chinese fill some of the gap. There, there's no real capital discipline in China. And thanks to massive 
wasteful and hugely expensive state support. The Chinese have built an impressive EV sector at home and secured control over the supply chains that feed it the whole way down the line. Uh, when you read about the uh, child labor in what is euphemistically in the Democratic Republic of Congo doing what is euphemistically referred to as artisanal mining, that's the, where the cobalt comes from, or a lot of the cobalt comes from, which goes into the battery, and a lot of that is basically under Chinese control. Uh, they are now, the Chinese, are now very well placed to supply a good number of the EVs that the planners would like to see on Western roads. Like Western EVs, these Chinese cars will still, in many respects, be inferior to the conventional uh, cars they replace. I mean, just for a second, I talked about charging. Uh, you know, we even if the charging stations are there under current technology, uh, it takes forever. The so-called fast chargers, about as fast as, as, as me trying to run a race, um, it, it takes forever. And it, the colder it gets, the longer it gets, as uh, people found out in uh, Chicago. But these Chinese cars are fine. Some of them, um, there's BYD, which is Build Your Dream. Uh, Warren Buffett is uh, an investor there. And it's pretty good. There's an up, up, up market model and so on. But there's cheapness and cheapness. And the cheapness, so-called cheapness, of the Chinese car may well, uh, part of the price you pay uh, might include the destruction of the Western auto sector, um, which is unable, which is, 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 is as Tavares warned uh, two years ago, is not going to be able to match the, uh, the Chinese prices uh, within any uh, a sufficient number of years. In addition, they don't have the advantages of incumbency that the internal con engine has given them. A Western automaker... Uh, uh, let us say uh, your Mercedes or your, your Ford, you, you've, been, you've been making internal combustion engines for a century or more. You are you're the brand. Now, only the genius of American and European central planning is to wipe out or to potentially wipe out a potentially or a, a critical industry and replace it with one in which newcomers, particularly ones that don't care about the cost of capital, People say, oh, well, it's, it's new investment. It's new investment. Um, it's not even really that. Uh, Bastia, a, a well-known economist, once said, if you smash a window, someone comes to repair the window. Is that investment? Is that creating growth? Well, not really. So we're replacing the internal combustion engine, which works, spending hundreds of billions or more to invest in a product which at best is comparable, at best. And that's not. And the waste of money that that involves is that the, the opportunity cost is spectacular. And as I says, you know, the prospect of handing so much of the, of the auto sector to the Chinese or to alarm anyone who understands geopolitics, um, which is all of you. What's more, given the, uh, the loss of good industrial jobs in the West that it would entail, such a takeover would also represent profound threat to Western economies and by extension, social peace. And uh, the trade unions are just beginning to realize that this is this, this is the uh, this is the case. The UAW have been saying a few things. Uh, you can see traces of this in Europe. Now, in reality, this threat is likely to be head off, headed off by steep tariffs on Chinese imports. Uh, certainly, in the at the moment, there are two tariff levels. There's, it's 27 and a half percent in the U.S., 10 percent in the EU uh, for, for Chinese uh, import for Chinese EVs. You can increase those tariffs. I, I think, uh, and in the U.S has to keep a slight eye of what's going on down in Mexico. Uh, there was news the other day that, and it wasn't, it wasn't it was semi-news, but I think it's true, a league of some sort, that, that BYD is uh, building, uh, we're planning to build a plant in Mexico, and that means that it can take advantage of whatever NAFTA is called these days. Assume you, you have Joe Biden is clearly aware of this. Uh, he has, see that thing about the other day, he was saying, well, the Chinese EVs could be a security risk a sort of tick-tock on wheels. Um, and uh, he obviously can see that there, there's a problem there. And uh, he also, incidentally, again, by a lot of leaks, is talking about pushing back the dates when the EPA regulations come in. But if you have a, if you stop the Chinese car coming in, the results of that, other than a trade war, and by the way, for the Europeans, that would be terrifying, because where does uh, Volkswagen, or where did, where's, what's the second biggest market, should I say, for German cars? China. So China, is, are there big uh, Volkswagen facilities? China. And just like Apple is beginning to learn, Chinese have a way of, yeah, thank you very much. We've enjoyed your presence. Thank you very much. We'll 
steal your IP. The Europeans know that if they increase tariffs, they will be severely punished by the Chinese, although they may have no choice. Meanwhile, that will leave the Western consumers only being able to buy Western EVs, and uh, they will be expensive, and they will, and many of them will find themselves priced out of the new market. However, the Western manufacturers are not allowed to sell thus to make use traditional cars, and many drivers may thus find themselves, because that'll push up the price of second-hand conventional cars, and many drivers will find themselves priced off the road. Uh, they won't be pleased, and uh, if we want to get to be conspiratorial, I think some environmentalists, however, will not be too sad about that. There's a whole war against the car thing going on, of which the transition to the EV is only chapter one. Meanwhile, even if they are spared the full force of the Chinese challenge, Western car companies are headed for a tough time. They have been pouring billions into the production of EVs that they don't want to make and consumers don't want to buy. It's not a good model. It's not a good model. And we are seeing now EVs sales. They're growing, by the way, there's no doubt about it. Many more millions of people are buying EVs, but the rate of growth is slowing. And the more consumers see of them, the more the sort of consumer who sees this is the only car I'm going to have, the more they look away and say, no, thanks. And then you've seen people like the rental companies. One of the horrors of the EV transfer has been getting stuck with an EV. There you are. You didn't ask for it and you've got it. There's some great stories being written about this. And Hertz are sort of handing them back. But the auto companies have been funding their investment in EV production with subsidies paid for by you and me, uh, or the luckless lenders uh, to Uncle Sam. And the profits they have been making from conventional car making, which have been very strong. But from this year, the way that the regulation works in the EU, UK, and I don't know if it's from this year, uh, in California, so far, and as it gets changed, what the EPA is proposing will effectively penalise auto companies if conventional cars make up too high a percentage of their sale, uh, financially penalised, uh, which is madness. Um, so, uh, how are they then, if the sales of conventional cars are going to be uh, penalised, where is the money going to come from to invest in EV production? Um, but it's a quota. And the central planning is not central planning without quotas. And if I had to guess, a massive auto bailout is sooner or later headed our way. And for anyone paying attention, you will notice that the car companies have been uh, doing, a number of them have been doing massive uh, share buybacks, returns of capital operations. You don't do that if you think that you can put the money constructively to work in your own business. Uh, there's a very clear signal to that. And it's in many sense a very appropriate way to put it. They're, they're, they're trying to get out of Dodge. And that's my theory. But I'll stick with it. I don't know how this ends, but I do know that uh, you may know, I'm sure you all know this quote, but I do know that Herb Stein was right when he said, if something cannot go on forever, it will stop. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where we are. We'll get back to next round in just a moment. But first, are you getting PRI's regular email updates? If not, go to pacificresearch.org and click the sign up button at the top of the page to get the facts you need to fight back delivered every week to your inbox. Every week, PRI sends you what you need to know about what's going on in Washington, D.C. and Sacramento and gives you the free market ideas needed to save our state and our nation. By going to pacificresearch.org and clicking the sign up button, you can sign up to have Policy Alert, our weekly roundup of all the best ideas from PRI scholars delivered to your inbox. Or you can sign up for event updates so you're the first to know when PRI is coming to your community with great events. So sign up now at pacificresearch.org and click the sign up button at the top of the page to get PRI's content delivered to your inbox each week. I thought I would open up uh, the conversation by asking Andrew about Germany, which um, I think as many of you, some of you might know in the audience, abruptly ended yeah. their, their subsidy program for EVs uh, in December of last year. I think they're facing a major budget crisis. Um, are there lessons that can be learned from Germany, and do you think that might change the tide of how things are shaping up here in 12 states and 12 countries that are pursuing these bans? Uh, I, I think there are lessons. From that. I mean, the, the, what, what happened in Germany was they cut the subsidy. So you saw a catastrophic fall in sales. That was exaggerated uh, by the fact that um, ahead of the, of the cut, cut in subsidy, the people were buying ahead. So, so that, 
that, that blew up. Uh, you know, the, the Germans are, if you have to rely on subsidies, and the Germans have a very specific budgetary problem, which would take three hours to talk about. The reality is a product that can only sell itself with the help of subsidies is not a product. Here it is a product. It's a Soviet car. If it cannot succeed in the marketplace, what are we doing investing right. money in? Uh, the Europeans do not have enough cash to subsidize EVs <laughs> indefinitely. They do not, at least in America, <laughs> we have people who could lend to us uh, another trillion. What a, uh, but Europeans don't have that luxury. Right. And uh, so that is, people are beginning to realize that. A little instructive thing is Germany used to be one of the world's leading producers of uh, wind turbine. Uh, they cut the subsidy. Where's, I think they have one factory. Yeah. 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 Total distortion yeah. for the market. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. And I also wanted to ask, um, you know, many consumers, I own a, um, a Tesla myself, and I wasn't particularly motivated by environment factors, although it's, I'm sure a lot of people are. I'm sure that's a, a reason why they buy them. But um, there have been many studies, some say are flawed, um, about the you know, the economic benefits from electric vehicles. And um, many of you may have saw, seen a Wall Street Journal op-ed, I think that came out last week, citing a study um, about the uh, particular particulates, uh, pollu- pollutants. Um, uh, particulates, yeah. Uh, from EVs compared to gas-powered vehicles. Um, and so th- there's a lot on, on both sides. Um, can you talk a little bit about where the research are, is on the environmental benefits, where it's heading, um, and if you think it might change the debate, uh, public opinion-wise, and also in terms of policymakers uh, when it comes to these uh, these mandates, these bans and, and subsidies? The, the first thing I say, policymakers will change their mind uh, with extreme uh, reluctance because it's a bit difficult to admit uh, that you were the captain of the Titanic. From a climate point of view, the savings offered by uh, EVs are real, but they are less than, um, ad- considerably less than advertised. And, um, and, and again, as I said, there is some work that suggests that they're uh, even smaller than than, than I was uh, suggesting. Particulates is an interesting problem. Uh, the uh, conventional cars give them off too. Basically what they are is the very small bits. And I am not a scientist, so we, I use terms like very small bits because that's all I understand. They are the little bits that fly off your tire, I think, as, as, as you drive along. And the problem with um, EV, and so it's conventional cars do it, but with uh, EVs, because they're much heavier, there's much more wear on uh, the tires. And incidentally on roads, by the way. Um, and so the other thing about EVs is everyone talks about, which is true, they're terrific, except acceleration. Uh, That's not great for tyres either. Um, They also are partly powered by something called, I think I've the phrase right, regenerative braking. Uh, Basically, when you brake a bit, that adds a bit of power back into the engine. Now, those of us who drive conventional cars, particularly for long distances uh, in New Mexico, are always happy at the low um, uh, gas consumption. Car going fast, although below the speed level, uh, for a long time uh, is a very efficient way for fuel efficiency. However, actually for an EV, it's the opposite. You want to be stopping and starting. Sure. Um, particulates, no one quite knows um, what they do because the research is anew. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the, the ludicrous London uh, low emission zone is, has been focusing attention on, on it. Um, is it a climate factor? I suppose it, it is, theoretically. And um, But again, do I think that the environmental question marks over EVs are going to make politicians change their mind? No. I think politicians will, make, will change their mind. Two reasons. One is that the money may irrevocably run out, and the other is enraged vote, enrage voters. Mm-hmm. And the last question I wanted to ask you about the mining industry um, globally, um, it seems like there's opportunity yeah. for them. Uh, but do you think that they're making the investments now for infrastructure and for expansion, or are they waiting to see if this is something that actually comes to fruition? Are they hedging their bets? I don't have any numbers there. I think they are. They're certainly looking. Uh, I mean, you, know, you read about projects in, in Nevada, it was one that caught my eye. Uh, the Swedes are looking at something in northern Sweden, and they are spending money on it. Are they going to, but the big issue with all these sort of projects is in the West, is getting the environmental approval. And that can be a very, very lengthy pro- uh, procedure. I saw a figure, I don't think it was in the journal, uh, but I saw a figure saying that from finding the deposit to opening the mine can take sort of 10 to 15 years. And so the answer is uh, that the spending is not front end loaded, which is why it's, you know, the first thing is the paperwork. Um, Do I think that we, 
and what, what, what do we know about environmentalists is, who in many ways are fundamentally, I think, anti-growth, uh, is that they are not going to give mining for EVs a special break. Sure, yeah, and, that political capital. Yeah, exactly. Theory. Yeah, they will do it if they can do it, but it's going to take time. Thank you, Andrew. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. And when you're on these platforms, don't forget to give us a big five stars. If you don't subscribe to any of these, you can still listen on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash Pacific Research One. That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Ichon. Hope you'll come back again for next round with PRI.